Garrett, the search for a so-called theory of everything, which is, of course, not everything, but just the laws of fundamental laws of physics, has fascinated physicists for, for a long time and has caused a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, you come along and say that you have a new idea how to unify the forces of nature. Uh, tell me about it. That's right. So there are these four forces in nature that we know of. We know of electromagnetism, which acts between electrically charged particles. But there are also three other forces. We have the weak nuclear force, which is like electromagnetism, but acts mostly within atomic nuclei and is moderated by particles called the W particles, uh, the same way that electromagnetism is mediated by photons. And then there's also the strong nuclear force, which is mediated by gluons, these other elementary particles that act between uh, these Quarks. That binds the nucleus together. That's right. right. That's right. These bind these quarks together in nuclei and bond the protons and neutrons together inside atoms. Um, and then there's also the force of gravity, which people, uh, to an approximation, is mediated by particles called gravitons. So these, these forces have a structure to them behind how they interact with all these elementary particles and how these different forces of electromagnetism and the weak force and the strong force and gravity all interact with the matter particles, which are the fermions, called the electrons, the quarks, and the neutrinos. And that makes up pretty much everything we see yeah, in the The universe. quarks make up the neutrons and protons that people are familiar That's with. That's right. So a, a proton will have two up and a down quark, whereas a neutron will have two downs and one up. And because of the electric charges of these things, so um, I guess the best way to describe it is the, uh, all these matter particles and some of the particles that carry the forces all have different charges on them with respect to the different forces. So for example, there's electric charge that people are familiar with, and an electron has an electric charge of minus one. But an up quark has an electric charge of two thirds, and a down quark has an electric charge of minus one third. Now these are all integral multiples of each other because it, it, comes from, it turns out to come from a specific geometry, right? And uh, I can go into that if you like. But when these particles interact, all their charges are conserved. This is just with respect to the electromagnetic force, right? But also, for each of the other charges, for the weak charge, the strong charge, and for gravity, you have different charges. So for the weak force, you also have weak charge. And for the strong force, you have what's called color charge. And for gravity, you have a charge called spin, right? That, and all these elementary particles have different quantized charges with respect to each of these different forces. And whenever there's an interaction between two particles coming together and, and mixing and then changing into a third that leaves, at that interaction, all of these charges are conserved. So these charges tell you what interactions are possible between elementary particles. And through this web of interacting elementary particles, buzzing about and interacting in our universe, this is where we see, this is where all matter uh, is described. This is everything we see. In the so universe. this looks very complicated when you look at it in terms of what's happening. There's so many different things. They look yes. like they're unrelated. And one of the great achievements of 20th century physics has been the unification of the different, well, first electromagnetism in the 19th century, yes. and then uh, then bringing in uh, uh, the, 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 weak, the weak force and then the strong force. Gravity is still out there, not, not yeah. brought in yet. But that's what a theory of everything is trying to do. And nobody is, is there yet. It seems to be pretty far away. But you claim to be a little closer than those who are far away. So what are you doing? What are you doing to make sense out of all of this? Well, I actually started out looking for a geometric understanding of what electrons are. And the reason I was looking for that is because we have a geometric description of what gravity is. Einstein figured out that the force of gravity actually corresponds to the geometry of curving space-time. Now, when you look at the other forces, such as electromagnetism and the weak force and the strong force, these also have geometric descriptions in terms of a mathematical structure called Lie groups. But when you look at the electrons and quarks, they don't seem to have the same sort of natural geometric description. They are described in a way that is acted on by these other forces, but they themselves didn't seem like geometric uh, entities. And it just seemed wrong to me that there would be some part of the universe that wasn't geometric if the rest of it was. You know, the universe is just one thing. So if there's going to be a unity, you think it has to be a geometric unity That's because right. you already know that gravity is a geometric structure. That's right. So I went looking for a geometric description of electrons. 
And in order to do that, I had to see how electrons interact with gravity and all the other forces. And when I did that, I saw that gravity sort of fit together uh, with the other forces in how it acted on electrons. And when I did that, there was a piece missing. And that piece turned out to be the gravitational frame and the Higgs field. And that was great because with this Higgs field coming in, that's a field that acts on all these fermions to give them the masses that they have. So I had this structure all together, and this structure of interactions uh, looked unusually pretty, right? It was an unusually tight structure, and it, uh, it held together really well. And I sort of had this crazy idea that maybe this entire structure fit inside some larger mathematical structure. So I went pouring through the math literature, looking for what this thing might be. And that's when I found that this entire structure of gravity and electromagnetism, the weak force and the strong force, including their interactions on all of the fermions, on the electrons and neutrinos and quarks, which make up absolutely everything that we know of in our universe, that entire structure all fits inside this one uh, very beautiful mathematical structure called the E8 Lie group. So tell me what an E8 Lie group is. Okay. Well, all of these... All of the forces we know of, electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force, correspond to the geometry of Lie groups. And mathematical physicists figured this out back in the 50s or so. And before that, mathematicians had figured out uh, what all these different Lie groups are back around 1890. They completed the classification of Lie groups. Now, what they actually are is these uh, geometric objects that are made by twisting circles around each other. It sounds trivially easy, but it actually gets quite involved. Because what you can do is, if you start with the, uh, the simplest Lie group, right, that would simply be a circle. Right? And this is the Lie group corresponding to the force of electromagnetism. Uh, if you can envision this, what happens is electromagnetism uh, consists of an electric and a magnetic field at every point in space-time. Right? And this electric and magnetic field derive from a field called the electromagnetic connection. And this connection actually tells you how circles connect to our space-time. That's where it gets that name. Um, if the geometric picture of this is that at every point in space-time, you have a circle attached to it. And you can take that circle and rotate it by some angle called the phase. Right? And the connection tells you how that phase changes as you move from one point to another in our space-time. So you have to remember that these circles are not in our space-time. They're over it, if you like, or attached to it, but outside of it. And they, since they're not in our space-time, they don't have a length associated with them. They don't have a size. They're just, uh, you have to think of them as circles attached to our space-time. But the important bit of information is their phase as you move around our space-time. And this is what the connection tells you. So, and so physically, we have physically these electric and magnetic fields in our space-time, and these correspond to the geometry of circles twisting over our space-time. Now, the other forces also correspond to other Lie groups. Now, a Lie group consists of sets of circles all twisting around one another. So if you take uh, one circle, as would correspond to the electromagnetic force, and then you take a, a second circle and you twist it around the first one, you get a torus, right? And, uh, but now if you take a third set of circles, you can take it and twist that around the other two. And as you do this, you can wind one set of circles around the other, right? And you can wind a finite number of times, right? Now, if this is the electromagnetic circle, then the number of times that winds corresponds exactly to the electric charge of that elementary particle. So whereas these circles correspond to the particles of light called photons, right? Each other circle corresponds to a different elementary particle. And the number of times these circles wind around the circle corresponding to electromagnetism, that's the electric charge of that particle. So how do you get the A? Okay. So uh, the way you build these Lie groups is uh, by winding sets of circles around one another. So if you take one circle and you take a second circle and you wrap this second circle around the other, but as you wrap it, you t put a twist in it, right? And then you take a third set of circles and you wrap that around these two, and as you go, you put a twist in that then these three sets of circles, all twisted together, form a continuous three-dimensional shape. And it's sort of like a little knot of geometry. And this is a Lie group. This is what a Lie group is. And this is called the Lie group SU2, right? And with the SU2 Lie group, 
you can pick out one set of circles, and the other circles will twist around that one central circle uh, such that they twist in opposite directions with one winding each. Right. So that these actually correspond to the W plus and the W minus bosons of the weak force. So these two elementary particles so correspond to each of these the geometries can describe individual particles. Yes. And so how do you get eight and bring it all together? Okay. So you keep going with this structure. So you bring in more and more sets of circles, twisting with a specific pattern. And you can actually plot what that pattern is. And you can actually plot what that pattern is just by counting the number of twists that these circles make around one another. And it gets more and more complicated. You can make more and more beautiful and larger geome geometric objects just by twisting all these sets of circles together. And when you plot their charges, you can see the pattern of twists just by plotting them out. And these aren't just pretty things. They actually correspond physically to these elementary particles careening about and interacting, conserving these charges as they interact. So this uh, elementary particles corresponds directly to this geometry. Now, to get up to eight, uh, what you're doing is you're wrapping more and more sets of circles around one another. And as you do this, you look in this large jumble of circles. Um, and once you've wrapped, uh, all, got all the way up to 248 sets of circles, wow. all wrapped around one another, within this 248 jumble of circles, you can find inside a high dimensional torus that consists of eight sets of circles wrapping around one another, but without twisting. And this uh -huh. is called the maximal torus inside the Lie group. Uh -huh. It's got a specific mathematical name. And then you look at all the other circles, right? The other 240 circles, and how they twist around each of the eight circles in this maximal torus. And each will have a twist number. It'll have you know one twist, two twists, up to you know uh, seven, or five or six. So you know as they're twisting around, and they all interlock to make one continuous smooth surface. That, uh, that holds together and is quite beautiful. Quite beautiful. You've said that beauty is one of the characteristics of the universe. Is that, uh, how do you feel about that in terms of your own sense of, uh, of, uh, of your own theory and, and the universe itself? Well, it's working with the mathematics. You get a feel for a while out of when the mathematics is going well. And a good sign that the mathematics you're working with is starting to describe our physical universe is actually when the mathematics itself has a beautiful structure to it. And usually when you do that, you're talking about a very abstract sense of beauty, right? You're talking about looking at this algebraic structure that can be very involved, you know, dealing with a large number of components all interacting amongst each other in a way that makes an abstract pattern. Now, and this is usually what mathematicians mean when they talk about the, the beauty of a, of a mathematical proof or of some mathematical structure. They're talking about this abstract sense of beauty. It's kind of like, it's as if there were a bunch of composers composing symphonies, but the symphonies were never played, right? It's just, and the composers just exchange papers on their symphonies and say, oh, wow, that's really beautiful, just because the, of these uh, mathematical structures are, are silent. <laughs> but... One of the great things that came out of working with these Lie groups is it turns out that you can plot these patterns of twists to give a very visual description of what's going on inside these Lie groups. And the patterns that come out of this are visually uh, quite pretty. And if they're not just art and not just mathematical structures, but, but you're claiming they really correspond to the way they the do. world works. They do. They correspond directly to the various charges that these elementary particles have. And in fact, this is why these charges are what they are. An electron is an electron because of its electric and weak and lack of strong charges. And to see that geometrically is beautiful. Yeah. When you plot all these things out and make a charge diagram, charting out all the twists going on in these Lie groups, it makes strikingly beautiful patterns, which was fantastic to see. And I worked with this stuff for 10 years before even knowing that there was this graphical representation of, the, of what I was working on. It was really kind of shocking to see it exist and I, because it, it was, I'd seen it in some of the older physics literature when people were first working on um, mesons and some of the baryons that come out of the strong interaction, but it's sort of fallen out of use in the physics literature. 
but it is a wonderful tool for seeing some of the structure in the standard model of particle physics itself, and also how this structure embeds in the larger and larger Lie groups of grand unified theories, which combine just electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force, and in a larger potential theory of everything, such as this E8 theory. So how does gravity fit into this theory of everything? The way gravity works in this theory is actually really interesting. And that is, within this E8 Lie group, you have a subgroup called spin 3-1, the Lie group of rotations of space-time. And this spin 3-1 Lie group is the Lie group of the gravitational force and describes how gravity works around massive bodies. Uh, what happens is, when you have some object moving through space-time, it rotates in space-time when it has some velocity in some direction. So you'll actually see its clock start Start, yeah. So you'll actually see its clock slow down, which is called time dilation, and you'll see its length contract, which is called Lorentz rotation. And what happens with gravity is at every point in space-time around a massive body, you have a spin connection that's trying to rotate all objects in the plane of uh, that body and time. Okay. So around some massive object, you have this gravitational spin connection such that all objects are trying to be space-time rotated uh, towards the center of the Earth. So this is what's giving you a velocity, trying to give you an acceleration towards the center, is this spin connection that's trying to rotate all of us. So all of us are moving forward in time right now, and it's the gravitational field, this spin connection, that's rotating us to try to give us an acceleration towards the center. And the only reason we're not accelerating downwards is we're pushing against it. Yeah. But this gives a, a very uh, succinct description of gravity that's consistent with Einstein's theory of gravity as the curvature of space-time, because we have the curvature of this combined Lie group and fabric. And is unified with the rest of the... the, the yeah, and it unifies the rest of these forces in this E8 Lie group.